Dr. Metzger, can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Can you see and hear us all right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, welcome, welcome. So go ahead with your case introduction, sir. Great. Well, listen, welcome back to Kingsport, Tennessee and uh, Ballard Health, uh, uh, Holston Valley Medical Center. We're thrilled and honored uh, to be part of New York Endovascular Symposium. So thank you to you, to PK and the organizers. Uh, we have a great case. Uh, before we start, I want to introduce my team. It is possible. Possible this will be my live case with these beloved soulmates. Um, so I want to introduce um, my friends here. To the, my right, um, uh, a, a tremendous talent uh, who's going to uh, guide the table, Alexis Mullins, uh, and her talents. Uh, to her right, uh, you saw her this morning as well, Lauren Blevins Omerovich. Behind us, uh, we have talents, uh, nursing talents of Michelle Tolliver uh, and Abby Reed. We have some really good uh, industry colleagues with Anna Jones. Uh, Aaron Heiss and Kenise Moyer, and in the back uh, is uh, Jennifer Linkus, uh, a good friend. So we have a very, very good case for you, and, and it, thanks to these folks. Let's go to our slides, please. All right, next slide. Uh, here are my disclosures. Next slide. Great guy here. This is a good story, too, by the way. 64-year-old gentleman. His only history in life in terms of medicines was two-pack-a-day smoking until January really good story in that he and his work crew had just gone through CPR classes three weeks before. Again, true story, which was a good thing because he went down at work, uh, required CPR, probable defibrillation, and went to an outside hospital with an anterior ion shock. Uh, at that hospital, they put a balloon pump and did his cath and then shipped him to another hospital where they put a 5.5 impella uh, in his axillary artery. Uh, and he ultimately had cabbage from which he's done a beautiful recovery from there, quit smoking everything. He had a small stroke when they took the impella out. He's made it from there. Uh, next uh, slide. Um, that will be an incidental one I'll show you, but he's, he's here because of severe hip and buttock claudication that's lifestyle and vocation limiting. It's been there for three or four years and a little bit unrecognized. Uh, it, um, he got better on medical therapy. His claudication did not. He had symptoms of his right arm, which again, not uh, the uh, point of this discussion, but we'll show you. Next slide. This is his right axillary pseudoaneurysm and stenosis. If you're interested, uh, this is Joe Hollywood here. He's going to be a live case for that for TCT uh, coming up, but that's not for today. Next slide. Um, <laughs> he's here today because of the claudication in his left leg. Um, PVRs, you can see, are very low, including the high thigh index, and they drop significantly with exercise. Uh, he has uh, monophasic flow throughout his left leg. CT angiogram, they've just made some security <laughs> changes. I can't break through that Fort Knox to show you. Just suffice it to say, it's occluded, as you're going to see, from the proximal left common iliac to the distal left external iliac artery, and he's here for endovascular therapy. Next slide. Uh, so in summary, it's a 64-year-old guy, a former tobacco use, which he's quit completely, uh, after uh, survived uh, that incident I told you with and had bypass has a, um, another live case pseudoaneurysm and then here for endovascular therapy for severe claudication and long left common and external uh, iliac CTO. Next slide. All right, uh, let's go to our floor, please. All right, so we start with vascular ultrasound in the good leg. Uh, is, is our case. We had to get venous access as well. That allows us to get uh, access in a good spot. And here's his uh, aortograms. You can see renals are patent. You can see a little bit of iliocolic probable collaterals down to the uh, this CTO. It's kind of off the field, but you can see those. I'll let the play again. You can see it down there filling up a little bit. Here's a closer to the action. There's the uh, occlusion of the left common iliac artery, and it's a very long occlusion. You can see that the left hypo is out but comes back via collaterals. The right hypo is open, fortunately. Right iliac system is pretty good. A little bit of plaque in the external, but not bad. And then here uh, is uh, where it reconstitutes in the distal external iliac artery. What we like to do is similar to what we do with uh, uh, EVAR and TAVR and, and, and whatever ours. Um, and especially if you've got a short uh, stick zone, we want to get as close as we could uh, to the bifurcation, so we had a little running room. So we use a combination of a smart map and vascular ultrasound, and we're able to get as close as we can get uh, there on the left retrograde. Um, 
And then here's a picture, uh, kind of a layout of the land, if you will, uh, right there. Um, let's show the hemodynamics, please. So this is from, uh, I'll let them get that up on the screen. And you can see in purple is what we've got in the aorta and the monophasic signal and the big gradient in the left common iliac artery. Uh, so we're going to take a picture here in just a moment. And you'll go from the ready to go. In just a moment, we'll have to take a breath. And then I'm going to walk around the room a little bit uh, while the panel tells us what's the best access route, uh, how should we uh, uh, cross this, should I even be doing this, uh, et cetera. All right, sir, in just a moment, we'll have to take a little breath. Ready? I'll tell you when. All right, take a little breath. Hold your breath, please. Look forward. Okay. Good. Breathe normally and hold nice and still, friend. All right, so let me turn it over to this panel that's smarter than I am. Tell me how to best fix this. What, what axis would you go with? So, Chris, how's his, how's his left arm? I know the right arm's a little bit suboptimal, but uh, have you... What about left radial axis and trying to come from the top down? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great question. He has, <laughs> unfortunately, a little left subclavian stenosis as well. He doesn't have a pseudoaneurysm and a little bit of a gradient. Uh, normally, I would take a picture of the uh, LIMA for you because sometimes that'll give you the extra collaterals, but it was a little hard to traverse the left subclavian, so we're just going to stay traversed. Um, I actually like to go um, brachial if it's big enough, uh, just because I think it's closer to the action and you could put a bigger sheath in if you need to. So the left arm is sufficient. So I, I'd like to hear everybody else's opinion, but I, I really think since we're so close to the action um, on, from the retrograde, I think we're truer to try to cross and stay in the lumen from above from the arm axis. So that's what we're going to do unless I hear other uh, compelling arguments not to. So I'll have you flur in just a moment. I mean, I, I, I would have done this a little differently, uh, Chris. I'm sure you're going to do a great job. But um, you have to have bilateral femoral access for this case anyhow because of the potential yep. need to treat the right iliac and to have angiography. And, and in most cases, you could do this entirely from the femoral axis without needing to come from above. Um, you can work with uh, selective catheters or now even steerable sheaths where you can have enough support to work from uh, uh, the contralateral side. And then you can also work from below. Um, it, to me, it doesn't really matter in the intervening segment whether you think you're true lumen or, or subintimal. Uh, it's really at the top and bottom where you want to reenter right at the uh, point of reconstitution, and you can do that coming from both sides with uh, uh, bilateral femoral access. That's how I'd tackle it. And then I'd be prepared if I needed to to come from upper extremity if things got really, really tough. But in most cases, you can do this from below. So, so Chris, it's PK. I, I think those, those I, are good points. Go ahead. Chris, it's PK. I'm just wondering, like, why, why not a hybrid approach? You've got common femoral artery disease there. Uh, do a cut down um, and then go ahead, place a sheath, and then come back up and then fix the common femoral. That's another thought. I'm just curious what, the, what our panel says. I know you're going to cross this. It's just a question of what the optimal therapy for the common femoral in this patient. Right. And, and I think if there was common femoral obstructive disease, I think you're spot on correct. Um, I don't think there was obstructive common femoral artery disease. So uh, that's why we're going to do it a different way. Uh, but I, I think those are great points. Um, uh, uh, Darren or whoever, that, that was a, you're talking about a tour guide deflectible tip, which we have in the room. Is that what you would use and try that first? Yeah, I mean, first I might just try, you know, a simple um, um, Omniflush yeah. or Sauce Omni catheter, and if that worked, fine, or Rim catheter, but if I needed a steerable sheath, I, I'd pull the steerable sheath, and that, that should be able to do it. You should be able to form it and to bury the tip in that, that stump in the left I common iliac and have enough pushability to do what you need to do. Um, I like, uh, I, I like the, uh, I'll start usually with a sauce catheter and just form it up. In most situations, you can use that. If that doesn't work, then the deflectible sheaths I've, I've found are honestly as, as effective as coming from the arm. I will say I, I personally like using brachial as opposed to radial doing these types of things. And for, for dealing with the, the brachial access, I've actually, uh, actually started using an oximeter on the hand where the brachial access is and monitoring that oximeter and the pulsatility of that oximetry waveform as I'm holding pressure, which has dramatically reduced my issues with problems related to brachial access. Yeah, uh, Dan, that's a great thought. 
Yeah, so I, I do the same thing as well too. Uh, um, and then I also stay pretty small uh, from above, so I might actually cross with an 014, 018 wire from <clears throat> above. But then uh, I, don't, I see no reason why you can't potentially cross it from both directions as well. If you are subintimal from below or even a small segment and you end up getting right to that nub, you could always use a re-entry tool like a Pioneer if you need to get back in. You have, a, you have a plenty of room to do that. Right. So go and take me up so I can watch it from the owner. We have the Pioneer ready. And, and I think you're right because if you need that, we want to get, I said, somebody said in the beginning, that's, far, that's plenty, um, you want to get into the nub. We do not want to enter the aorta lateral wall ever. Um, and we don't want to go into the common femoral artery from the lateral segment. So if we couldn't get through this in the wire, you're exactly right. We'd use a Pioneer and the ultrasound so we hit the nub. All right, so follow me down, please. So what I'm doing now is we, I think we crossed it exactly where we wanted to, uh, but the vertebral catheter, which I needed for direction, would not cross this. So this is just a Navicross. And then I'm going to take a picture to make sure that we're as good as I think we are. Not as good as we think we are. I mean, the position's is good. I'll take the luck in terms of the good, but um, let me just make sure I've got good bleed back here. Make sure we're off coupling, and I'll just do a quick angiogram. Do you have some dye here? Can I get a syringe, please? So, Dr. Yeah, Metzger, I have question. a question. You know, we, we saw this on common femoral disease. Uh, with your sheet sitting in there, how do you plan to treat that? Yeah, I don't think there is, but, but if there okay. is, we'll see when we're done. Since we're from above, um, we can do a DCB. What if we did that? Ready? Just Sine, make sure there's no coupling. Go ahead. Sine. Okay, good. Uh, what we could do is do an atherotomy. Okay, that's good. Thanks. Um, let's take a super core exchange. Uh, what we would do is take an, uh, do an atherotomy and then a long drug coated balloon if we needed to. I don't think there's calcium. So normally, if it was heavily calcified, we'd do lithotripsy angioplasty. I don't think we need to do that here. Go ahead and uh, stop that. Make a smart map if you would. Just now, a question for the panelists. Uh, in certain please. situations, you know, I've had a lot of issues with brachial axis. So uh, with uh, an institution which is comfortable with uh, perk axe for tavers and impellers, uh, is that an option to treat iliac disease or iliofemoral disease? If you cannot, you know? Yes. <clears throat> and we'll take the five. And I, and I we'll share your concerns with brachial axis, probably of all the axis approaches that's the one with the highest complication so depends what what my sheet size is going to be if it's small like under five or six french i break is okay if you're going to go any bigger than that usually you may yeah. need a cut down to to, to to control that at the end and, and in a case like that, that i think off. axillary has a role because you can put a larger sheath in and you can do a lot more work from the axillary approach and i also think it's safer in the end you see in these situations i, I would just do what i mean you can stay relatively small to cross. You can even stay relatively small to balloon and then end up fixing it from below. Yeah, no, I agree. So yeah. if you're doing yeah. it with, with low profile stuff, fine. One. But if you need yeah. to Let's go, go back up, up, up in profile, uh, brachial the... becomes much less safe. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that's why the transradial approach is kind of nice because you just stay, stay really small there, just purely for wire crossing, but not really delivering equipment. But, but again, I'd just do it from femoral and yeah. then you don't even no, need yeah. the upper extremity I, I mean, approach. I would just yeah. femoral as well. Yeah, plus I think if, if, this is where institutional stuff you know, matters too, because uh, in our hospital, uh, someone pulling a brachial sheath is more dangerous than any of the balloons or, <laughs> yeah. or stents that we yeah. have, yeah. Which including is, including my partners. I was going to say, which is, which is why I, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm doing those brachial accesses, yeah. uh, the, the re removals myself. I'm not yeah. having them yeah, done yeah, by anybody yeah, else. Uh, yeah, and to that point, uh, what you mentioned earlier, then the uh, advantage of having the pulse oximeter on the, uh, on the hand is also helpful when you do your compression. I'll tell you when to go up, okay. Because then you can just compress until you still see a little wave form, uh, and then you know you're still not occlusive with your compression. Yeah, that, that, that's what I was uh, talking, that's when I use it primarily. I, I, I actually found that out <laughs> when I was compressing a brachial artery where they had an A-line, yes. where the anesthesiologist had placed yeah. an A-line, and I realized how beneficial that was for me in terms of knowing right, sir, how much pressure. Sir, taking a small breath, hold, hold your breath. But I, but I also use it during the procedure just to make sure that there's no spasm uh, yeah. and still perfusion. And it's a very good training method also if you put it on the uh, on the foot for uh, residents yeah. To, to, yeah. to learn how much pressure they need to exert. Yeah. Right. Just a moment, I'll have you, you I think so in this case I would... 
would come from the from below for the um, for the uh, treatment of the and I hold the wire and cannulate probably the oh. uh, the sheath. Shit. Let me shoot. So sorry, a little bit of table gymnastics here coming behind you. Um, all right, hold that wire. Fluoro. Yeah, you on fluoro. And the other the other thing about dealing with the radial and brachial is when I'm doing this, I'm normally standing on the patient's right. And we start going from radial and brachial. Now, all of a sudden, we have to have tables on both sides. I just find it a lot more challenging to deal with that than dive. doing all go of this go for the balloon. From, from the femoral approach. Yeah. Well, what all, balloon all is that, Dr. Metz? I'm taking because I'm getting my steps in eight. Uh, so, but we're, we're ballooning from above. And I, I like everybody's idea there. And what I mean by that is uh, we almost treat it like most of us would treat uh, a tibial axis. Just like, as everybody said there, we're crossing. We're, we stayed five uh, French from the brachial. Honestly, you, I, I think with a micropuncture stick with ultrasound, uh, I think you're going to be just fine uh, with that. Uh, and then we can just, we'll just cross from above. And as somebody mentioned, we'll either externalize this wire uh, from above or once we do balloon work, uh, then just uh, uh, cross from retrograde and finish the job from the uh, bigger sheath uh, below. So right now, all we're doing uh, is a five by 100 conservative balloon from above. Uh, it's an Armada 035 balloon. I probably should have used an 018. It would attract easier, but this will be fine. Come on down slowly, please. So Dr. It's Metzger. It's a long reason, though. I tell you, we, we're going to have uh, a little bit of stent length to go here. So I'm going to go over here. Chris, it looks like you have again, here, bilateral venous sheaths in. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah the, and there's a couple of reasons for that, Dan. Um, so we, I, I like two good IVs. Uh, now, um, the uh, first one was because we had really poor IV access. The second was because I inadvertently hit a vein, and I thought, ah, heck, I'll leave it in there. So thanks for, for <laughs> thanks for putting that out for me. <laughs> Dan doesn't miss a thing. That's good. He doesn't miss a thing. He's an eagle hawk, man. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Metzger, uh, I saw that you crossed very elegantly. And, and uh, if somebody crosses so easily, do you have it concerns for easily, thrombus? And do you think ballooning might risk the risk of uh, distal thromboembolization? Would you have IVIS before? How would you change that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So it brings up the, the common femoral hybrid approach because that would have given, actually, quite honestly, uh, and I'll say it to my surgical colleagues and friends. Go ahead and send that or just write... Uh, Smart, uh, spot stead. Um, that gives you a beautiful protection there. This one did not cross easily, and I had the benefit of the CT angiogram, which I couldn't show you, mm -hmm. but trust me, it was not uh, thrombus, and this has been a clue that his symptoms have been there for three or four years. Uh, so this wasn't a recent event, but good points, and again, the hybrid approach would help with that, to be sure. All right, so let's, uh, do you feel that a little bit? Does he feel that? Can you check with him? On the panel, would you have uh, oh, IVIS? Okay. And we have occlusion balloons and all those kind of things in the room, and we're checking with him to make sure that he doesn't feel things. Take this out if you're back. I think it's up. helpful to do an inflation first because you, yeah. you know, just to get your IVIS across the lesion, mm -hmm. you have to do something. Yeah. And, and normally yeah. this is similar to what I would do. Dilate the tract, then you right. can assess it with IVIS, give you the upper and lower extent of the disease, what it looks like, as well as vessel diameters. So, uh, but to right. your point, though, if your wire crosses really easily, I actually just had this happen last week. You know, instead of taking anything else across, I typically will take a seven prime strong back to me catheter, just run a reel through quick. And sometimes, even on IVIS, soft plaque can sometimes be indistinguishable from thrombus. So, you, it's almost like thromboatherectomy. Mm -hmm. And you'll be amazed what you end up with after you run the uh, thrombectomy, thrombectomy through there. Yeah. But I think history. History dictates a lot. All right, sir, just a moment. We'll have you take but, uh, a breath. We've coupled. But I've been fooled by history, too. You could have a proximal and a distal from, I mean, a fibrotic cap. And in between, okay, so you could have some small problems. Breath, hold uh, your breath. Especially, I mean, ISR case. That's why the wire yeah. test is useful. I mean, like yeah. I said, if your wire sails across and you can see it, it's, it's knuckling through there and it's very easy, then you know, there probably is some hibernating clot in there. Yeah, that's a beautiful result with I, just the fiber balloon. No, I... I, I so I, I think you're right. It's actually surprisingly happily good. Um, and so now let me ask, would you um, cross and try to externalize the wire or just see if it easily crosses retrograde and go from there? i just see if you can easily cross it. You'll cross it. I'm, I have confidence. 
All right. Well, I love I love your confidence. Uh, and so let's do that. Let's take an angled glide wire and that short navicross. cross. I'm going to make a smart map of that. Now, if you will show the hemodynamics, please. Look how nicely the hemodynamics have improved just by ballooning this. Yeah, that, now, that's impressive. I mean, then, then the Go ahead, yeah. Chris, sorry. And then the question is, should we stent this whole uh, I, uh, range or do we IVUS? And we'll see how that's going to work here. Um, let's, uh, yeah, I think you should IVUS. So you deal. may not have to stent that whole area. I think that's a good point. We'll, we'll stent the proximal occlusion for sure. Uh, okay, that's not working. All right. I mean, the yeah. data would suggest, so though, for a long occlusion iliac that we, we generally stent those. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that I would not stent that yeah. if I IVUS did. Yeah, I think that I think what I'm saying is yeah. it's part of the part that extends down near the common femoral. Yeah, no, I would take the stent right, right down to the yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, circumflex iliac and, and those branches without covering it. And, and I think you'd be fine yeah. because that actually looked pretty good on the initial angio. But, but IVUS yeah. could be useful there to make sure it's perfect at the end. Let's take our super core wire. But I would plan on, so somebody, on stenting this entire Yeah, somebody's way. confidence, uh, thank you, it helped. We did cross, up. It, it crossed pretty easily after the balloon. So we're going to just put a support wire and then work from uh, below. What kind of stents are you thinking, Dr. Metzger? Yeah, it's a great question. Let me ask the panel. So the hypo was occluded. Um, I see it, that's just a super core wire. Um, the um, hypo was occluded, but it fills via collaterals. The right hypo is gorgeous. So I, I don't think we have to worry about covering the um, hypo that's already occluded with a covered stent. It, it, let me ask the surgeons and some of the others, just your, there's a lot of smart people on that panel. What do you think? Are we okay to just go ahead and uh, put a covered VBX type stent that's flexible and such? Yes. So I, I, I would, if the hypo's patent, I would preserve it. it but if it's occluded yeah. chronically and you've got a beautiful hypo on the other side, then, then I would just use covered stents because I think that then you get, you know, a really nice result that you're effectively doing <coughs> the orto-femoral bypass on that side. Exactly. I have to admit, I, okay. I, uh, I primarily will use covered stents up top and just standard self-expanding uncovered stents Night below. And, stents below. And, and, and honestly, I don't think there's a difference in performance that I've seen anywhere in those. And... I got to tell you, sometimes in these patients but where the origin eight, is occluded of large gastric, and you dilate it and you stent it, it'll open up. Yeah. So I'm I yeah. don't just blow it off because it's not there. I would think you use that, a drug eluting stent, or would you use a bare self expanding With this diameter, I mean, if you look at this guy's yeah, vessel diameter, I think just a regular self expanding that stent that's without pretty routine in, in a in a female or a smaller yeah, vessel, or then I would consider a yeah, Medicaid yeah. stent. Yeah, see, I think yeah, after you right. IVUS, there's enough of a landing zone to where if you used a self expanding, I don't think you should have any real fear we that you're going to pop up stent? into the aorta. Okay. I think you can land it just fine. The, the only fear, and maybe that's influenced the way I practice and it's anecdotal, but I once recanalized some extensive iliac occlusions. It, it looked beautiful. I thought it'd be cute to do everything through six French and use bare metal stents. And two hours later, a uh, guy was probably hanging on by some adventitious somehow. He, he ruptured and bled uh, into his retroperitoneum and, and arrested and almost died. And I was able to get him back and put covered stents in, but then he had an abdominal compartment and all sorts of things. So my, my rule ever since then, when I'm treating long occlusions, that's part of the reason why I favored covered stents because I was so affected by that experience. Yeah, yeah I, I had the exact same. I think I talked about that in a previous CVS as well too. I think I freaked you out about that. It was like literally three hours later, delayed rupture. I mean, it looked pristine yeah. on the table with a bare metal stent. And then you could just see it just exploded. And just, you know, now, once we get maybe if, if uh, you know, I don't remember if I had IVUS afterwards to see and if I would have been able to tell, but um, it, it really is. Once it happens to you, you're just like, you. I don't know. It's <laughs> yeah, and the leg, not a big deal. You're not going to die from like, that. No, no one's ever challenged me about the amount of money you could you're die from a rupture. That, so. And so I think that that's the, <clears throat> I will that's say the point I, uh, that's influenced me. I'm not aggressively dilating those self-expanding stents in the external. And over time, yeah, they clearly do expand further. Maybe, maybe that's the difference. Uh, that particular case that I did wasn't also very calcified either. So I, I still wonder about it. But, uh, you know, I think there may have, the patient, I think, had some previous pelvic radiation. So that might have been a contributing factor. You know, I share that with you, too. I've had patients who are chronic methotrexate and prednisone. I mean, okay, they're on sir, treatment. Just a moment, we're going to have to take a little breath and hold it. We'll let you know when. So 
Dr. Mesker, right. using an 8 large by 79 VBX, what I heard? Yes. All right, here we go. Take a small breath. Hold it. So what we're going to do now is just put an 8 large, which gives us the flexibility of getting really big, breathe normally. And I will tell you, while you guys were talking, so was my, our beloved staff here. So I, I was going to pull the wrong wire, uh, truth be told, and, and they would not. I mean, they were dug heels in, man. No, you're not. Uh, and and it's, it's great to have a good team, as, as everybody here knows. All right. All right. Could, so hit view roadmap for me. All right. And, and again, so everybody look at this, please. And I'll get to, okay, next. I think that's a pretty good position. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Right at the Austin, yeah. Yep, right there. All right. Go ahead. Go up. Just a question for the a panel. Discomfort, sir, while we do our little stint. I have a question for the panel. Well, you know, you think 79 is a little longer that because hurts. it goes into the Sorry, part sir. of the iliac which uh, moves retroperitoneal to anterior. Well, it's a it's point a VBX, of restenosis. Though, so, and, yeah. I mean, it's a VBX, yeah. so it's going to flex and, and turn. Should, uh, it should be fine. I mean, the balloon the will straighten, doesn't but, uh, flex like but a, it'll flex. I know. It's not, not like <laughs> the self-expanding. I, I, I don't think you can think of it as a like a super flexible stem. Right. <laughs> but it does take pretty tortuosity flexible. pretty well. Yeah. And I, I think you're far yeah. enough up yeah. with this stent that you're really not in an area that moves back, tremendously. Back it just a little bit. What I want to do is make a measurement. All right. Uh, Let's make sure. So what I want to do is since we have a 79 in there, and I'm with you, Dan, I, we're going to use a um, nitinol stent for the rest of the way. But we've got a measuring stick in there. This is a 79 uh, millimeter measuring stick. So let's a little picture from below if it may be a little bit hard we may get a little okay the coupling off all right ready wait for it okay all right now uh so that's a uh 79 i was going to use an 80 i don't know that we want to go that we don't uh let's go with a 60 so let's go with a 9 by 60 absolute pro please Dr. Metzger, you think there's a little tear up there on the right. proximal SFA distal common femoral? Would you now, let me ask you, so would you, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stent this from below. Uh, are you still okay with that uh, in terms of the night and all stent? I think we have enough room that we can do that pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah, the panel says yeah. Uh, I, I think the other thing that, that uh, Chris is doing here it's not talking about is he sized that self-expanding stent a couple of millimeters larger than the balloon expandable stent he put in. You, you want to make sure you have that attached. You don't want to leave that kind of floating in the balloon expandable stent that you have above. So, And I think the common femoral is okay. There may be a little linear de mm -hmm. defect, but I think that's just where I've been... Um, um, I've got the sheath barely in the vessel there, but I don't think the common femorari will need to be fixed. I think we're going to stop today uh, when we fix the external and common iliac arteries. So we're going to put in the Absolute Pro now. It's a 9 by 60. I hope it's going to be long enough. For some reason, these look, they always are a little bit longer than what uh, they look. That's a good thing. Phil, go back to the hemodynamics too, please. And if you'll notice, they're almost superimposable. It's kind of, I don't know what color you'd call that, maybe magenta and aqua, I don't know. Uh, but it almost makes one continuous uh, color. Yeah. Oh, okay. Are you right? <clears throat> All right, we'll go back to uh, our fluoro. So, Chris, why not just use, I mean, if you're hesitant about the length, why not just use an 80 millimeter self-expanding stuff? Yeah. I, 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 you're, you're right, Dan, although I, if you see here, we're going to have enough overlap. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I really, it, that's why I use the measuring stick technique, uh, if you will. I think this is going to be okay. I'll try to place it with you. I may have you fluoro. All right. And then fluoro, please. John fluoro. All right. So we're right above the lateral circumflex, and we're overlapped. So I'm going to unlock this, and it often wants to move just a hair like it just did. Okay, come off and floor save. Thank you. And I'm going to hold the sheath while you get this out. Okay, come on out. Yep. 
All right, we'll give you an angiogram. And then if this looks okay, we're kind of in the touch-up mode. Uh, and you can maybe go back to the Mount Sinai. I'm sure they've got, I'll, leave, I'll follow your direction. We can Ivis and post deal, whatever you want to do. But I want to be respectful of uh, PK and the, and the gang uh, up north. Uh, so, so right, sir, in just a moment, we're going to have you take a little breath and hold it. We'll let you know when. Yeah. No. Oh. Okay. All right, sir, here we go. Taking a small breath. Hold your breath, please. Hold nice and still. Yeah, I won't need yours. Keep holding. And we're not coupled. Good, breathe normally. Okay. That's because the doctor didn't say coupled, so I'm not blaming anybody but Chris. We're going to do that again. Good <laughs> breath hold, sir. That was a good practice one. Let's do it again. All right, ready? All right, here we go. Taking a small breath again. Perfectly. We are coupled because now I asked. All right. All mine. Keep holding, sir. Good, breathe normally. Now, that's pretty interesting because... We'll probably Ivis that. There looks like a, a little bit of retrograde dissection up top. Let me give you an oblique. And we'll probably Ivis, sorry about that, and do a little touch-up. Uh, and we'll need some more dye in order to do that. So, Dr. Mexico, well, while you, you do think, the uh, Ivis and the uh, touch-up... Most of the time, they, these are going to heal themselves. Let me get to some thoughts from the panel. This was. You know, it looks like it's something that would probably heal. I have to admit, I'm a little... I'd like to be sure that the proximal origin of that is open adequately and that it's not impacting that itself. Yeah. I mean, your your pressure doesn't show that, so you know, it may not be an issue, but I'd like to, this is where you'd like to have an axial image to make sure that it's yeah. not impairing so your what, flow and so forth. I, I think that's a great idea. Since we have an eight French sheath, would, is 035 Ivis going to be okay or would you go smaller with no one eight? It's, might it's as well. fine. You could use the 035. Yeah, might as well. Yeah, you can use either one. Yeah, okay. You just so let's do this. Um, they're loading up some dye. Why don't you go back to um, uh, uh, Mount Sinai and just touch base with us. If you want to come back, we're going to Ivis it and set that up. Uh, but I don't want to keep you hostage here if you want to go back to uh, uh, Mount Sinai. Yep, that sounds good, Dr. Metzger. We'll come back. We switch to Sinai. You know, as we're waiting for that, I had a question for the panelists. We, we've seen that resting ABIs can be novel in aortoiliac Oscar, disease. Oscar, they're live. Oh, they're live. Sorry. Yeah. Do we have? Oh, there you go. Dr. Metzka, welcome back. Can you hear us? <clears throat> Can't hear you. I don't think they can hear us. Yeah. Do we'll fix there? Question for the panel, you think an IVUS and lithotripsy may have avoided that? No. no. Yeah. Uh, that's not due to calcium, necessarily. So it looks like, I mean, maybe that stent foreshortened some when it was being dilated, because right. it looks uh -huh. like it was a little short, and it, yeah. I, I think he was putting an extension in there approximately. Because yep. you saw that on the Sinai case also, that they, they looked like they were above the bifurcation. But they landed the completion, down. they weren't. Where, they were right yeah, at the bifurcation. Yeah. <clears throat> So yeah, sometimes like I'll cheat in the aorta a little bit too when I'm putting that VBX and knowing that it's, you, you, you have some predictability. If you go right to nominal, it's not going to foreshorten, but when you go above, then you know it's going to retract in both directions. So um, yeah, I think that's just experience more than anything else, but you know, a couple millimeters will help protect against that, I think. The other thing is when these balloons all have an inflation port that's actually proximal and the... The lower part of that balloon is, is in the iliac and is trapped as soon as it gets inflated. Most of the foreshortening will happen, at, should happen at the top of the stent, not at the bottom. <clears throat> Dr. Metzger, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. All right, good. Well, look, for, for speed's sake, let me just say we Ivis it. I like the comment about having good inflow into the common iliac occlusion, that we, and it was a long occlusion. Um, and so for good or for bad, uh, we chose to put a short stent here, guided by our IVUS, and that's what this is here. Now, I will ask the panel, um, there was that little dissection, did we need a covered stent there, yes or no? Because remember, the covered stent for VBX, the shortest length is gonna be 29, and the, for an atrium, for example, it's 38, once you get up to this size range. My thought was we didn't need 
um, a covered stent up here, much to Dan's comments. So this is a nine by 19 OmniLink guided by the IVUS uh, right here. You can see there's a little shadow. You can also see I pulled my 014, 018 wire so we didn't stent across it. And then we can send that back up for an IVUS here in just a moment. We deployed it and then post it, and this is where we are right now. Um, and let's show us the gradient, please. And you can see there's zero gradient again. We get aquamarine or whatever you call this uh, color. I'm not very good with that, so I apologize. Um, there is a little retrograde stuff up there, but the IVUS on that looks good. There's no dissection flap. There's no stenosis above it. Uh, so I think we're going to stop for right here, but I'd be very open for comments uh, from the panel. Well, I, I think, you know, honestly, the IVUS image is really, I think, going to be critical here. And as long as that doesn't show a problem, I think that, that this will over time be fine. I am concerned that if you if you treat further up on this side, you're going to wind up having to treat on the other side yeah. as well. And you're making no, ex exactly. a lot more than what you were. I, I think the real issue, Chris, and I don't know the answer to this, is why, why do you think this happened? That's a great question. He had pain, Dan, when uh, we did the inflation. Um, and, and I just think that, you know, it's hard to know. Remember he had a pseudoaneurysm in his right um, axillary, albeit... Um, um, iatrogenic said right by the way it was normal vasculitic labs were normal but he felt it when I put the VBX in and I just think the proximal shoulder into a four-year-old occlusion just caused that little dissection as best I can tell don't like it wish it wouldn't have happened um, but I'm with you I think because it's retrograde I think it's going to seal itself um, I'll be open to suggestions from the panel but I think what we'll do uh, is get earlier than usual CT angiogram follow-up uh, and certainly PVRs, and, and obviously we're going to, he'll be on antiplatelet therapy and statins, and he already quit smoking, and we'll, he'll know to call us immediately should he have any event. What would your surveillance be uh, from the panel here? I, I yeah. good. I'd, I'd use a duplex, because I think you could easily see this with duplex, um, and I might even do one before he leaves, so I have something to compare it to when he comes back. Aortic, aortic also. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Dan. This is not uncommon, um, and probably part of the issue is that even though there was a stump that looked like it was open, I'm sure that's diseased. I mean, that's the nature of this type of disease, yep. so it's not altogether surprising that, that, that you get a little break and a little dissection. Most of the time, it's fine, but I might observe the patient overnight and yeah. image them to make sure yeah. they're, great, they're good because before I send them home. Sometimes you do get that, uh, that hematoma that can form, and then you can potentially compromise lumen, but... I haven't seen that happen at the aortic level. I've seen it happen further downstream, but um, I think overnight observation is not a terrible idea. Yeah, that's the only reason I was thinking about CT is the compression thing that you may not appreciate with ultrasound, but that might just be my ultrasound people. <laughs> and I agree with not chasing this right now. If your yeah. IVUS looks good now, I'd yeah. stop, yeah, yeah. observe them, just yeah, make sure that uh, imaging yeah. shows that everything's okay before, uh, before he goes home. Well, la last point, as we're trying to teach a good audience there, if we had to go back and do something differently, to Darren's point, should have taken the VBX right up to the bifurcation to begin with um, and maybe would have avoided this. What do you think? Maybe even a little bit into the aorta, yeah. Chris. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the worst thing that happens there is you take a balloon from the other side and just dilate it simultaneously it. as you're doing it. Oh, yeah. Dr. Metzger. So even at my age, it's you can still learn. Uh, so uh, uh, so that, that's very helpful. So, I, I, uh, well, uh, listen, uh, thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Chris, thank you. Job. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Metzger. Thank you, team. Uh, we're going to switch back to Sinai. All right. So we're going to run the IVAS. We did